Jobsworth, Season 1, Episode 2, The Remote Revolution. Welcome to episode two of Jobsworth. My guest this time round is Bobby King, the CEO and co-founder of a company called Squeptech, who are actually also one of my clients. I worked with Bobby for a few years now after an introduction made by her husband, who was actually a, a former contractor of mine, who we talk about in this episode, funnily enough. I'm sure your ears have been burning, Phil. Whilst it might sound like I have to say this, she is quite honestly one of my favorite people in the world to work with. In this episode, we talk about her years growing up in Romania before heading over to the UK and falling into tech, her experience building a new life in a new country and learning the lingo after touching down in the Northwest, and how she's built an inclusive and supportive culture in a business where all of her people work 100% remotely. This chat with Bobby was inspiring and insightful in equal measure, and her approach to remote work and the flexibility it affords her, her team, and also me when recruiting for them will tell even the staunchest of the Get Back to the Office Brigade. Without further ado, it's my genuine pleasure to introduce you to Bobby King, Bobbyisms and all. Welcome, Bobby. Thank you for being one of the first guests as well. Thank you, John. (laughs) No, it was a genuine pleasure to be able to invite you and have the conversation with you as well. So it's really great. So I'm going to dive in with a question. So when you were at school, What did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, gosh. I wasn't entirely sure. Initially, I wanted to be a skier. I wanted to go into skiing and all that kind of good stuff on the mountain. I grew up in the village in Romania. Okay. In a small village called Sinaya. And I was in a ski school. I think I was about four. I wanted to do skiing. That was what I wanted to do. It was very hard work, though. So I soon decided that not for me. With quite a bit of influence from my mum and dad, of course, because education is much more important than just, you know, spending your entire life skiing. And then my mum convinced me that I'm going to be very good being a doctor. Wow. Yeah, it wasn't an awful lot of weight into that, but I did look good in white. That was the strength behind that suggestion. I like it. So set of circumstances within school, and I ended up doing my last two years of high school, which were in Romania, doing chemistry and biology as the two main subjects. And I wasn't very good friends with chemistry. We didn't get along at all. Right. So that was the end of that. Completely U-turn and switched on to do economics instead. So I ended up having private tutoring for maths and economics so that can go off and get a degree in international commerce wow okay so from a skier to international commerce slightly bit of a variation between one or the other but there you go definitely so yeah i wasn't expecting you to say you wanted to be a skier bobby maybe we've not gone into this much detail (laughs) in previous conversations before but that is quite a turnaround isn't it from skiing it was yeah okay no that's great all right well thank you for going into that as well so you talked about growing up in romania as well you come to the uk in 1999 Is that right? It was. Yeah. So Yes, April 99. April 99. Okay. So what prompted that move and what was the transition like coming into the UK as well and I guess acclimatising to life in a different country? Well, let's just put it this way. I was 24 at the time and I probably don't want to do it again. Okay. Yeah. So I ended up here through my ex-husband actually. Okay. Whom I met in Romania and a few months after we got married he came back to the uk and it was the realization that oh actually i married a british person so that kind of makes sense for me to come along and relocate to the uk okay so i think it was uh, it was a very short romance type of thing ended up in the uk sadly it didn't last but yeah that was the reason why i came here and to be fair at 24 it wasn't too difficult to kind of adjust but it was a huge difference all i knew about britain was what i read in the classics yeah and when we tried to put dickens into the reality of 1999 it was a massive difference it's a slight difference it's only a slight difference yeah 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 i think my surprise at the time was when you read your Dickens, you get the feeling that the Brits are cold. And that's exactly the opposite. Mm. That was the thing that I really, really liked. I didn't expect that. 
I couldn't understand accents. I was six when I had my first English tutor, so I was pretty proficient. I was going to ask that, yeah. In English. However, we were taught a little bit more like the Queen's English. And when I came to the UK, I came into Manchester, north of Manchester. Yeah. Very broad Mancunian. I lived in Oldham and travelling out in Oldham into Rochdale, straight away another accent. So I really struggled with that. And 25 years old on, I still can't understand all the Scots from Glasgow. Right, yeah. I don't think you'll be alone. (laughs) No, probably not. But I think that was the difficult thing. It was I was expecting something which wasn't what I expected. And people were extremely warm and welcoming. Mm. But I think coming from a job, I was working for a company called Romero in Romania, which is the equivalent of a British aerospace. Got you. Wow. Uh, was at the time. Mm. Coming from there as a graduate into the UK and having to do temp jobs. And one of the jobs I'll never forget, my job was to file paperwork into this shed that smelt of mice. <laughs> and um, Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> That wasn't pleasant. You know, at 24, you're taking in your stride. Would I do it again now? Not entirely sure. (laughs) But I guess the experience that you had in Romania and then coming over, you've already been able to overcome the language barrier because of your study up to that point. I guess that ease, that transition is made slightly easier by that. But again, you've immersed yourself into, a, I think, an area of the country that I love. I'll caveat all of this with that. But I think the boundaries between those changes in dialect a a little closer knit you could drive even an hour and then be speaking to people with a very different accent so for you coming over having as you said learnt the queen's english it's a huge transition isn't it but you immersed yourself into the right part of the country to to pick that up it was hilarious we made friends with this couple and they are still my closest friends here in fact they're so close they are my my son's godparents oh wow i'll never forget we met them in the pub of course and we just clicked even now they remember those days when i was having a you know, normal conversation with them with my accent that I came with and then things like the chip butter yeah. just kind of came in which was completely northern with the <laughs> accent to go with it and it was just hilarious I kind of started having these bobbies and some of the words with a slight different accent and everything so it just became a bit of me I suppose I love your bobbyisms, <laughs> and I'm not just saying this because you're a client but I know you've labelled them bobbyisms before and I think they're great I think you've mixed some <laughs> fantastic metaphors and analogies over the time that I've worked with you and I think it's amazing so don't don't hold back on the Bobbyisms Bobby it's all good <laughs> so yeah so you moved here in the in 99 jobless so coming from and yeah. again having developed that work ethic from Romania come come here you've got the language skills to be able to work you've had over 20 years working in the tech industry mm. what was your first break into technology after working with the equivalent of BA? BAE systems coming over yeah. and then doing that. So, or British Aerospace, sorry. Yeah. So I think it was probably six months after I moved here and um, I started doing a uh, map cover um, job. Six months was supposed to be for a company called SSL International. They're no longer around. They've been, they are now record bankies they've been taken over. And my first job um, was in a documentation department. And there were tons and tons and tons of documents which were describing the products, the bill of materials and all that kind of stuff. They needed to be typed into the computer. There was no nothing electronically. So that was my first job. So right. touch typing, one or one, straight on. Yep. Um, and going through so many documents, I in effect learned the products that there were that, that the company was dealing with. Um, and it's a pretty good, you know, there was some fun stuff because obviously SSL, same as uh, Record are doing our, some, some of their flagship product at the time, uh, where the Shoal product and Durex. Yep. So you can just about imagine what fun times there were. Um, <laughs> so learned all of that and then started working with some of the systems um, where all the bill of materials were maintained in. Um, black screen, green writing. Um, system called BPix. Yeah. So that kind of became um, that was my first introduction to to tech. Wow. Um, then we had PeopleSoft implemented, so it was a slight, you know, um, um, kind of involvement in that um, in that system. But I think I kind of my, my breakthrough in IT came after I had my son. 
um, to 2004 when I came back from maternity leave. Um, and there was an opportunity for me to move into, into IT with the introduction of SAP at the company. And we started doing a, a, an SAP implementation um, globally. Right. And because of my knowledge of the products, um, I moved into, into IT in the data management team. And that was pretty much the beginning of, of my IT wow. career, going from typing documents in a few years later, moving into IT and then becoming part of that team, um, moved on to be data, um, data development manager um, a few years down the line, then moved into uh, a quality management as kind of when the rec- just before the record bank is a takeover, I picked up a system called Trackwise, which is a quality management system. Um, so I got certified in how to configure that, and again, kind of another another string to my bow. Um, and then life kind of goes, and um, there was redundancies as part of the, um, the part of takeover, and I was one um, one of the persons that was caught into that. And then moving to um, another company called Amec which is now called Wood. So they yep. um, went them through well. a few takeovers mm. um, in IT. So from there, joined as a business analyst, but then very quickly moved into a project management. And one of the one of the um, projects that I had at the time um, was something, you know, it was a very old system that um, the company had, which needed to kind of be revamped. Um, and literally we started from a piece of paper. And that was what made me fall in love with system development and that's why we do development in square tech Got you. that was the thing that kind of clinched it for me and i'll you know never never forget the days when we're sitting in meetings and we had papers and drafting and drawing this is what how we want the system to log this is how we want this is what we want the system to do that that was that was the beginning of today wow if you like yeah because I was, I was going to ask about that kind of what the what the passion was that you felt that you wanted to move in and start Squeptech in the first place, but also to transition and, and continue on that career that you built over two decades mm. doing that as well. I always find it a little bit scarier when you say two decades rather than 20 years, but you know, it's, it's a really <laughs> successful career uh, as well. Um, so back in 2004, I've got some stats as well to, because obviously the number of um, women working in tech or STEM roles um, there's still, a, I guess, there's, there's still a lot to be done to to get equality in terms of numbers yeah. of men and women working in tech. So, as of as of now, so a report done in 2021 was talking about there only being 24 percent of women in tech roles. So we talked about you being one of only 16 percent of female tech leaders. Now there's 24 percent of women in tech roles. Back in 2004. I mean, I should have done the research before we started, and I'll, I'll do that on the back of this, but I can't imagine what that split would have been. You know, 20 years ago, I can only imagine that number's going to be drastically lower than that as well. So did you face any challenges, maybe not so much with the opportunity, but being a woman working in technology or working in in that kind of development space, did you face any challenges at the time? I think I was lucky um, because I didn't, I didn't necessarily get... A hard run, if I could call it that, um, that with with it. it. Back in the SSL days, we really had um, like a family close group of people, and I think if I think the team was quite evenly matched, okay. male and female. Mm. Um, there was a very short period of time in in um, in SSL where I had one particular manager. For a, I think it must have been about six months, and that chap made a really big impression on me in terms of how he kind of uh, it got something. He kind of sparked something of um, in in me of wanting to be a little bit more, and for a, an individual to make such a big kind of impression on. Um, on on a person it's 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 a huge huge achievement hmm. I, i'm, I'm going to give him a, a, a shout out if i can if i may please do yeah and um, there's a chap called uh, graham little he's um i can't even remember what the conversations were but i do remember having a couple, couple couple of chats with him around when we were doing a bit of a performance and get to know your manager kind of kind of stuff i think he was um 
And it wasn't necessarily what he said, it's how he said it. Mm. And with my background coming from, from Romania, not, not that in Romania women are oppressed or anything like that, but it's a completely different expectation. I'll give you an example. Um, it, back in the days, 25 years ago, as a woman, you had to know, learn how to pickle food. That's what we used to do in the communist days. Wow. Okay. We used to pickle mm. food for winter. Um, and the jars and jars and jars and jars of pickled food on, on the balconies kept on uh, the cool and all that kind of stuff. So as a woman, you had to know how to pickle food. I haven't got a clue how to pickle, by the way. Um, you, you know, you, you had to, um, it, at the countryside, you had to prepare, your, you know, as a, as a girl, you had to create all your kind of clothing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I wasn't one of them. Mm. I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't fitting that kind of thing. My, my parents have just had completely different ideas um, to what, what they want to do with me. And they were there even to today. They are my biggest advocates. That's amazing. Yeah. I think that's so um, powerful. So, uh, mm. and, and, and my dad always said to me that, you know, your, your world is your oyster. Mm. And Graham said something that rekindled that. By that time, by the time that um, I, I was reporting to Graham, um, I've gone through divorce. Um, so it was a really hard time. Um, I've got no family in the UK. And all I had was my, my, two, my two friends. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a tough, tough time. And Graham did something. Graham did a sparkle. And then I met Phil. Mm. So talk, talk to us about Phil, yeah, talk to us about Phil, because I, yeah. I know Phil, but whoever's listening yeah. probably doesn't know Phil, so talk about Phil and the no, impact he's had no. as well. Well, he's amazing. He's, uh, <laughs> I probably don't say to him enough how, how amazing he is. Um, so he, he, all, he worked as a salsa, we, we, we met through work. And um, I wasn't interested in in, 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 have, in in a relationship at the time. I kind of had it off. Mm. And um, eventually we, we went out for something to, to eat in Manchester. We went in a lovely Portuguese um, place. And um, I thought, oh, I'm going to go out. I'm not going to like being out with this guy. Um, really, you know, not for me and all the kind of stuff. And I remember going back home in the taxi that night and thinking, oh, shit, I'd really... I do like him. <laughs> you can you can say whatever you want, Bobby. Don't worry about that. No, that's yeah. So there was that revelation. It was that feeling. Was that sort of gut feeling yeah. the, of oh yeah, there, there might be something there. Yeah, um, and actually, we were in Piacenza in Italy with work when the whole thing kind of you know all the stars aligned and that was it. Yeah, and uh, um, and he's just been there. He's been there for me, and he's been there for Christiane, and he's been. You know, he's been and still is an absolutely wonderful dad for, mm. for Christiane. Um, but for, for me, I think he was the one when I was, um, I was, I was at AMEC and there, there was a period of time where it was quite tough there. He basically held me through the, through all that. He's my biggest advocate, he's, you know, he's, he's spread your wings. Um, and right now, I'll be honest, He's doing the cleaning, he's doing the cooking, he's doing the dog walk, he's doing everything. So Bobby can do what she dreams of doing. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah. It's a modern modern man. He sounds like a modern man, the definition of yeah. A, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, absolutely. So yeah, he's my rock. No, that's fantastic. Um, just going back to your parents and the sort of cultural differences growing up in Romania mm. and then and then coming over to the UK as well. How much do you feel like there's an innate drive in you to do something different than what is culturally maybe expected of you? And then how much of that yeah. is nurtured by your parents as well? I think you alluded to maybe the fact that that was really driven into you by your parents, but what's the balance, do you think? Well, um, my mum is probably the hardest working person I've ever known in my life. Mm, wow. Um, she's an accountant um, and she is 71 and she's only retired two years ago. Amazing. And she's always strived to be the best. It's just something that is within her. Um, even at 70, she was still attending courses. She was still going and 
doing, you know, I need to know what is going on. And even now she doesn't work and she's still reading the legislation that happens to chase from one day to another day. Yeah. Um, so she, that's, that's what I had in, in, in my life. I've seen that all the time. And my dad is the balance to that. My dad is the one that was choosing books for me when I was little. And then we were talking about what, what we read. Mm. He was the one that um, introduced me to all the British classics. Um, he's the one that, you know, he was saying, oh, you can't read that book because you're a little bit too young for that. Right. And he was telling me stories about what he did at school. And guess what? I went and copied. So as a consequence, I was sneaking books into school and reading under the bench in the middle of the hours and I got caught so many times because <laughs> um, obviously you can tell that when the you know, kids aren't paying attention, yeah. but he's encouraged all of that. You know, I've never been told off or anything like that. Dad used to laugh and I said, brilliant. You know, I think there are worse things that kids are getting caught for now doing in class as well. Yeah. So just, just doing some extracurricular reading is probably the, the best case yeah. scenario, isn't it? For teachers yeah. catching yeah. you doing something in class. So I think, I think that's fantastic, yeah. but that was driven so a lot of this drive that you've got is kind of, they were role models for you and they were absolutely. representing that. Yeah, absolutely. My, my dad always, always said, um, doesn't matter who is around you, it matters who you are. Mm. Um, and I, 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 to some respect, sometimes I kind of look at and dad says, I didn't actually realise that you've taken those words exactly as I said them. Mm. Um, but I have no, um, the world that I'm in that right now is a highly competitive world. Um, and you know, it's very easy to get lost in it if you look into someone else's garden. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's one of those things. And the other thing that my dad said, and he's absolutely true, as long as you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you've got nothing to blame yourself for or feel guilty about. And you can analyze your own faults and try to put them right. Then that's all you want to ask from yourself. That's mm. all you want from you as an individual. And um, as, as a consequence, I'm aware what people are doing around me and I'm learning from what other people around me are doing. But maybe sound harsh, I don't care what people are doing. I'm just looking at me. What do I want to do? Mm. I'm looking at my team. What do I want to do with my team? I'm looking at what's the art of the possible, seeing the opportunity and just take it. Yeah, I think that's so important. And I think um, focusing on your own race ultimately, isn't it? And not being not becoming obsessed what your competitors are doing. And obviously you're working in the tech space. It's ultra competitive. There are always going to be businesses out there that are, if you get focused on that sort of racing mentality that may be edging a little bit further ahead in what they're doing, but mm. you have to focus on staying in your own lane and building in, in your case and the best product or the, or the best service that you can for the clients that you're working with as well. And that's really inspiring. I'd love to meet your parents. I think they sound like just fascinating <laughs> people and that whole story and and the lessons they've they've given you I think are, are great and also Graham from SSL just highlighting the importance of mm. having an advocate having a champion having someone that is and in, that inspires you to do something mm. more I think if if we go back most of us in our lives hopefully we can identify at least one person that's been that for us and then obviously Phil is yeah is your day-to-day -day cheerleader and champion as well. So much more than that, obviously, but you've got, you've had a great yeah. support network, even though when you came to the UK, you hardly had any support network actually in country. So It was bizarre, mm. I have to say. Between 2004 and 2006, I had the two, you know, the two friends, Wendy and Stuart, that have just been there for us all the time. And I had my mum and dad flying in for a week at a time, either together or one at a time to, to babysit Christian when I had to go out wow. um, with work. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so. Amazing. You know, those, those four people have just been, yeah, I, I don't think I would have been able to do what I, I'm doing and be here. Um, and, you know, Phil, Phil came in at the right time and he was the one that got me to look after myself, um, you know, mentally and physically. And you've got children, John, so, you know, bad cop, good cop. Yep. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. It was always the good cop who okay. gets who the bad one was. Yeah. Um, but, you know, having that partnership and having that support and, um, you know, when I when, when I decided that I'm going to go off and, and do consulting, um, he, he was there and kind of supported all of that. And then right at the beginning of Skeptic and, yeah, he, he's my, my, my biggest cheerleader. Good. And, uh, well, I can attest to that as well, because actually Phil... I, I I first was introduced to you by Phil, and Phil Phil and yeah. I um, have worked basically in my previous life in my previous agency. I placed Phil in a role, and we've kept in touch since that point as well. And I remember the first conversation I had with Phil when he was mentioning his other half and saying that you had this venture. And I think on that specific day you had a meeting in London, and he was kind of nervous for you about it. Obviously, incredibly confident you go and do an amazing job, but. I remember just having that chat and, and just being all, like inspired without ever having spoken to you as well because he was just so full of admiration for what it was you were doing. So that was really lovely to hear. And then subsequently we got introduced and, and that's how we started working together as well. But if we fast forward, so come to the UK, SSL, AMEC, we fast forward to 2016 and this idea that you've had to found what would then go on to become Squeptech. Now, I, you've told me bits and pieces about this story before. I know wine was involved, but you, was. you sit down and you have a conversation. <laughs> Tell me a bit more about what goes through your mind in, in the genesis uh, of a business like this. So um, there, were, there were a couple of things that we were working on at, at, at AMEC, which I didn't quite get, um, get to do. And there were, um, Sarah um, is um, is the person I was having I was I was I was having the wine with. Hmm. Um, so Sarah came up to 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 um, to Nutsford, um, for meetings and whatnot, and um, she stopped over to my house. Um, she often used to do that, and I just came out through through another redundancy and. Um, we had some wine. We also had some Southern Comfort. Okay, I'll have to say mixing drinks. Um, yeah. Yeah, mixing drinks. And um, we were talking about um, two things. So Sarah's a project manager and um, and she did, and she, um, she ran a few projects, um, but not in IT. And obviously by that time, I was a project manager in IT. And Sarah used to be um, my, um, spo- not my sponsor, my client, internal client for the projects that we were doing at AMEC. And we always have this conversation on, on what do you do with the project, what stage you are, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the, the original idea was we're going to write a book guiding people who are um, project managers but not IT project management and flagging out the differences between what, um, what's one, what's the other, what's the difference between how you manage one project, what do you need to keep an eye out for, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so that's where the idea started. And then very, very quickly after that, we started talking, oh, can you imagine there's a gap in the market to do competency assessments? And there is a gap in the market because we knew the work that we were doing at uh, AMEC, it flagged that. Um, but it was a little bit more than that. It was not just the assessment. It was how you go into the assessment. You, you know, you do your training, you do your, you know, you acquire that initial skill. But then how do you take that and further that? So we started talking and we started talking. So it wouldn't be amazing if we do this. Wouldn't be amazing if we do that. And um, one thing led to another. And Sarah said, well, if you can write the requirements, um, John can... Um, can build a system so it's all right then let's just do that um so off we go and i wrote all the requirements and all that kind of good stuff passed it over to john and sometime later a few months later sarah message said oh can we um can we go on a call john's got something to to show you it was eight o'clock it was late at night um and go on a call go on a teams and john share the screen and start and show me what he's done on the back of the requirements and you know when you get one of those moments that you kind of have a look have a look have a look and all of a sudden you twist around and you just kind of stare i remember i remember completely zooming in and focusing on my screen Mm. and i kind of went this has legs this so has legs so we had a few more meetings john has put a few more 
twist on on onto where we were working and and then that was it so it was an instant decision right we're setting up the company john and i are going to go in together we need a cto we need a ceo at the time all we had in the company was the cto and the ceo yeah. and nothing else um and that was it and that literally just kind of took off took off from there so yeah it literally was over over at that point john and i haven't actually met face to face yeah so just so just to for anyone that doesn't know who john is so john it has got some incredible experience in a background his career is in in development software development yeah and he's the co-founder of, of Scriptech. yes yep. okay yeah so that's amazing isn't it and i think that's that's such a um i don't know that's like a modern tale of how so many businesses are, are founded now as well you don't have to have physically met the person yeah. you're actually setting mm. up with no exactly and um i think when when we actually first met face to face was i can't remember what the order actually um but um sarah and john came up to manchester to for, for a gig um so as it happens really 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 odd circumstances um the the chap that was um, my son's uh, guitar teacher <laughs> has a band that John and Sarah really liked, and they were playing in Manchester. So I said, "Well, why don't you come up?" And we're all gonna go. And um, turns out that I probably spend most of the time outside with some other friends to turn up and Phil entertained quite a lot of John and John and Sarah because I was going in and out and <laughs> yeah. So it was it was really it was a really funny set of circumstances. And then oh, the the only other time that we met face to face and I can't remember again which one was first, whether it was the gig one or it was the the uh, our first client, we both went together and um yeah, we met in the car park for the first time. <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it? Or second time, whichever one it was. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it kind of proves that the trust, obviously Sarah was the glue between between the two of that us. That was the common thread, wasn't it, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. So so, so, so Sarah was there in, in, you know, to kind of connect, connect the two together. But, you know, um, John and I kind of fit in hmm. together. So he's he's the tech brains. He's the one that writes the solution. He's the one the the one that in the background is is keeping the lights on um you know all the stuff which is not a glam which is not um you know is not mainstream but without it, everything is going to collapse in the heat yep. he's that mm. um and i'm the i'm i'm the voice i suppose um of of, of Squeptech and the disruptor i'm gonna have to say that the minute that bobby gets on a call and bobby says I've got an idea. Everybody goes, oh, God, what she thought of now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. I, I mean, I, I was present for, I don't know what you called that that couple of days. If, if you know, different companies have oh, different... Oh, the get-together. The get-together. Get, yeah, yeah, yeah. get so, so I was present for that. And I saw you standing up in front of your company and talking about ideas and fielding questions from your team and how you dealt with that and managed that as well. And yeah, you just it, it's a very powerful thing to... To, to watch. I mean, I don't work with you day to day, Bobby. So maybe it's powerful for me and a pain in the ass for people that work for you. I don't know. But um, no, possibly. <laughs> possibly, who knows? Um, but no, it's, it is incredibly powerful. And you can see how you inspire the the people that work for, for Scriptech as well. And again, having met John, I think if you've got a partnership as co-founders of a business, you need to complement each other. If you've both got yeah. strengths in the same areas... I've seen from some of the clients I've even worked with that you can tend mm. to have a bit of friction between you as well. So you need to complement the areas that maybe aren't the strengths of someone else. What I'm trying to do with the team is exactly that. So obviously when you grow, you've got an awful lot of areas to cover within within a business. Mm. And as you acquire more clients, as you acquire more clients from various verticals, then it becomes really important that you've got a number of skill sets. So um, four and a half years on, if you look at everyone in Squeptech, we are all different. The overlap of behavior, characters, competencies, it's very small. And that's a deliberate, hmm. it's a deliberate um, way of building the team. <clears throat> because that's one thing that dad all also said, you're never going to win the, re the race alone. Hmm. It might be a runner, you might be a skier, but you've got a whole team behind you yep. to help you to achieve what you want to achieve. Mm. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do with Squeptech. 
all people that are here or have been here or you know or they will come in I'm looking for that fit I'm looking for people who complement each other people that work well people that can share knowledge and develop each other and that's what I'm trying to build that's the culture that that I like to to continue building the square tech mm. very open um top bottom bottom up yeah um we we are not afraid to fail failure in my world in my world is an opportunity to learn yep. there is absolutely no way that in this life you can go about and all you're going to have is just successes but it depends how you want to treat the failure or the you know the the mishaps or whatever happens that is an opportunity to learn that is an opportunity to dissect take the goods understand what happened that didn't quite work well and turn around to your advantage and that to me is is the most important thing that you can or, or i can not necessarily teach because i'm not a teacher for the for, for, for the guys but encourage i want people to be open and honest and i want people to share all kinds of experiences within the team because that's the only way they can be better and that's the only way that makes us unique yeah and what you're facilitating as a leader then is that environment where it's it's a safe space to fail and it, yeah provided you're going to learn from it and provided you you can yeah. maybe reverse engineer why that failure has happened as well. And that's really powerful. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those. Is, as an individual, you can just stagnate or you can flourish. Hmm. And the only flourishing, the only way that you can flourish is with, with, with taking advantage of the people that are around you and learning from all those people. And it might be that, you know, you might find in that process that what you learn is not something that you're really interested in. Hmm. And then you do a sidestep and then you move out, you go to a different company, you go to do something else. That's perfectly fine. That's absolutely normal. Because unless you try to find what it is that works for you, you're always going to be dissatisfied in the job that you are doing. Mm. And I guess that's the reason, that's another reason why I set up Scraptech. And that's another reason why it's fully remote as well. I mean, when Christiane was little, I used to spend two and a half, three hours on the road in some days going to work and coming back to pick him up mm. and putting him in um in nursery i think it must be i used to drop him off at half six seven o'clock in the morning and then pick him up at half five six o'clock at night but it's a long time to miss out of out of out of his day so with squad i mean obviously held by the fact that i'm i'm in north and john's in south uh, <laughs> you know that doesn't necessarily work with an office um but then I can't imagine anything worse as a, as, a, as a young parent to go through what I went through, where, you know, you had no opportunity, you had no way but just leave your child and go to work and then go and pick, yeah. pick them up when they're too tired and within two hours you've got to put them to bed. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I think I've experienced elements of that with my young kids and that was, that was probably the genesis of Global Tech Collective and setting up on my own as well. Mm. Having autonomy to, to build the balance that I wanted. You'll know as someone <laughs> has started a, a much larger business than mine, but sometimes that balance is completely off kilter as well. But yeah. at least you're the master of it. You know, if you're taking more work on, that's on mm. you. You're not beholden to bosses or managers yeah. that are putting that on you as well. And you mentioned Squeptech being a fully remote business and that's something I really wanted to touch upon as well and it's interesting because I was going to ask where the genesis of that decision to to be fully remote came from and it sounds like it was a decision that was made before the the p word the pandemic so yeah, so yeah. you were working fully remotely before it became fashionable from day one yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah. So, it was a conscious decision even if John would have been closer to to me or me closer to john we would not have set up a on-prem or with office business so um, so that works when there's two of you how does mm -hmm. it start to work as you as you begin to scale so you go from yourself and john so two people what's what's the head count now put you on the spot but how many people have you gosh, got in the business I think now it's 30 30 32 okay maybe. so in quite a short space of time so business was founded in 2016 kind of really started to pick up speed from 2018 onwards is that fair to say yeah so you've got it's pretty much yeah, yeah so you've gone from two to 30 plus so the remote working works with two how do you scale that as well did you come across problems or challenges as you 
as you continue to scale? There are always challenges, and the ch- I think the, the 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 main one is you you don't have the coffee chats. Mm. You know, when you're in the office, you can have some conversations as you're tootling out to. Um, to make a coffee or to go to a meeting room or whatever. You don't have that. Um, And there isn't a way to compensate for that fully Mm. when you are, when you are fully remote. But um, what we do do, we take advantage of technology. So we use teams heavily internally and we have all sorts. We've got, you know, um, cornerstone um, corner. We've got, um, breaks we've got squad calls every friday there's a squad call just attend if you're not doing anything else and you know do whatever you want to you want to do we do have some meetings which are permanent meetings in the calendars that you can go for a coffee chat or a tea chat or a cheese chat or you know all of those kind of things but um i think and and I'll, i'll be honest some people have joined us and couldn't cope with that so we did we did have some people who couldn't hack not being in a, in in an office um but what we do do we kind of encourage um do activities through the day that take you out mm. of the house so whilst we've got a 9 till 5 and whilst we've got to serve the 9 till 5 clients um I do encourage people to go to the gym, go, go at lunchtime or, or go first thing in the morning or go whenever, whenever you can fit your own activities, go for that, yep. go for, you know, really sad. I've been known to do um, walking meetings, taking out Gus, my dog for a walk mm. whilst I'm having a whilst I'm having a call, either internal some some clients appreciate that. I think the the, the other the other thing that I'll 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 have to say is um our clients appreciate us being human as well. Yeah. And I think that helped a lot. So, you know, if we've got one of our children, including my nineteen year old, popping in the background in the middle of a call when I'm talking to a client, that's okay. Mm. This is who we are. I'm not a robot talking to as a client. I've got family, I've got a dog, I've got Phil, I'll show you something really funny in a minute about Gus <laughs> who embarrassed me in the middle of a call but it was hilarious he broke the ice and he was awesome but these kind of things you won't be able to know the human side of an individual without that yeah I, I think that's something that just became more prevalent during during lockdown really with the yeah. the way that Microsoft Teams and Zoom blew up and the way it was being mm. implemented and utilized by businesses as well there was that BBC interview, very famous interview, where the guy is suited and booted in his front room and then his babies come in <laughs> and the mum comes in pulling the babies out of the room. And that was such a big thing at the time, wasn't it? But what I've seen in the last couple yeah. of years, I've seen much worse than that happen <laughs> midway through calls. Yeah. And, and, it, and, and, I, and I think that's right. I think it makes, it shows a human side of you and that allows better yeah. buy-in as well. You don't yeah. have to be this corporate polished the no. face of a business all no. the time you you can be no. human and fallible and and that's yeah. again i think that helps with buy-in big time with clients i i i'd like to think so we were on a call i can't remember which client we were with but um every, everybody was very very serious on a call and um and, and my home and um i've got i've got the office and you can see the behind me the the hallway yep. and um in the middle of a very serious conversation, Gus decides to do a bum walk all across the road, the back road. Oh, amazing. Do you know wow. what? It was hilarious. Yeah. It was absolutely hilarious. Yeah. Everybody started laughing. Yeah. It was the right break at the right time yeah. to reset. Yeah. And that is, you know, you can't take this, this type of things away. Mm. You know, we talk about when you're in the office, you, you, you talk about this and that, um, you know, to kind of, humanize yourselves and learn about your families and all the rest of it that's exactly what i'm encouraging with a with with the remote working mm. you know we talk about our dogs because you can see them in the background you can see cats going across the you know the screen it's not unprofessional it's who we are mm. as human beings and if you can't talk to me about my cat or about my me, my human life, then we're robots. And sadly, with AI coming, we might end up being robots. Yeah. But yeah. until that time, that's how you kind of, I don't know, It's um, it allows people to be people. Mm. I, I, which, which I think is really important. I mean, the way, 
I mean, I, I am a sort of master of my own destiny in terms of I don't manage anyone else but me. But, but a lot a lot of my marketing <laughs> is, is very, you know, I'm just trying to showcase elements of my personality to show that I am a human being. And, and that helps you stand out, especially in the kind of space that you're in. I'd say yeah. just having that human side, which is enabled by, I don't know, it's just, it's just embracing that, um, helps yeah. you combat that kind of corporate stuffiness that is so... I think prevalent in a lot of maybe some of your competitors as well and and in consulting yeah. generally. So I think it's admirable and I'm slightly biased because I work with you, but in an unbiased <laughs> way. And um, you describe Screptec as a kind of boutique, as a boutique company, but a, a small company with this mighty culture. For, for businesses that are maybe a couple of stages prior to where you are at the moment, Bobby, did you proactively look at building a culture did you sit down and say this is what I want the culture of the business to be have you gone at that with this conscious effort or has it just happened and now you're trying to nurture it as as you continue to grow yes and no um so I you know me I'm very you know open and honest and if it's black is black if it's white is white mm-hmm. and you know if there's anything in between then I will do my hardest to describe the shade of gray that I'm talking about mm-hmm. Um, and that in effect is what we are. So, you know, integrity, be open and honest, you know, be agile. No one wants to wait million years for something to be fixed, Mm -hmm. you know, be sensitive about the people around you. Those are to me, those are traits that what a human being should have. You know, in Romania, there's a saying, you know, you need to have um, your seven years from um, home, not very well translated. But in effect, in Romania, you don't go to school until you're seven. Right. So the first seven years of your life are the ones that define you, are the ones for where your parents are kind of instilling the behaviors and values within Imprinting, you. Imprinting. Which then yeah. they are. Exactly, yeah, it's the you know, is the blueprint that is applying in those seven years. And from those seven years, once you go to school, they just define and mature and nurture and, and all that all that kind of stuff. So unless you've got those common sense seven years kind of um building of the of, of, of the culture, um, then you know, it's it's just um I don't know, it's to, to me it's common sense, it's being human, being approachable. Um so to some respect I've been in big companies and I've been in, you know, corporate 50, 60,000 thousand people and things become impersonal because of the size, of course, but it, they, they're also impersonal even at, at, at a lower level um, teams within, within that company. Mm. Um, it's okay. You can adapt. Anybody can adapt in those situations. But when you try to build a business, when you try to to start something up, everyone that is part and parcel of that of, of, of that business has to be invested. And the only way that you get people to invest is in, in the company if you are being open and honest and you know, you 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 help people around. And I, I think that's where that's where the you know, all of all, all of the the ethos that we have internally is coming from. Mm. It literally is natural. Have you know the 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 the, the, the nice part of a of, of a person that, that we all strive to be. And and there's another thing. Someone from within the business said said this a while ago. Um, when you're part of the big company, you know that what you do on a day to day basis contributes to the growth and the well-being of that particular company but you don't see it mm. in Squeptic you do every single one of us through what we do every day you can see the company going forward mm. yeah in in january we had um our second get together you know i said then i'm hoping that from our new financial year we should be able to introduce benefits as a growing business you can't do those things you can't you know you and and the people who are investing in you understand that need to understand that that you know you can't have your i don't know what kind of you know company cars all the bells and, and whistles yeah all the bells mm. and whistles and all that kind of stuff you can't you just it's just impossible you grow growing towards that so in january i said if everything is going as it has been then from 
November, uh, New Year. We are looking to do all sorts of other good things and all that kind of stuff. Well, I can't tell you how happy I was when we drew the line under the mid-year and I went, we can bring healthcare benefits now. Amazing. Mm. And it was one of those fulfilling moments. It's like, I'm six months ahead of where I wanted to be. And yeah, it, it, and you know, we, we, we chose a brilliant company and the guy, guys, guys are you know, having a wonderful time. And there's more to come. There's more to come in the new yeah. year. And I, I think, as you say, I think when you're, when you're building the culture, and again, I've got a good insight into the culture of Squeptech. I think as a founder, what you're putting out initially is your values, your ways of working, what you hold dear, the traits that you want to embody. And as you start to hire, you can't help but find people that they're not clones of you, Bobby, by any stretch of the imagination, but yeah. but show aspects of that as well. And that starts to grow from there. And one of the loveliest things, again, in, in having that opportunity to meet you all in, in, in real life, is seeing how that translates to you all being together as a team. Because again, it's complementing each other. It's seeing that holistic team and knowing that that it just works as a whole. It was it was really lovely to see. Yeah, I don't. To to be fair, you you probably won't be able to 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 find, or very difficult to find two people who are who are the same. Mm. Um, and you might need you, you you might have a need of that. Um, but in our team, each one of us has something different that gels us and glues us together you know um different sense of humor um different take on 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 life um you know different skill sets and it you know the the, the january get together was really cool to see how how people have kind of grown since since august um and we're still bringing new people in who you know, it's nice now. We're, we're we're at a point now where people are knocking in the door. Um, can I join you? Mm. And there is no bigger compliment than that. People that you know tap you on on, on LinkedIn and said, "Gosh, can what what are you doing?" The you know, it's a little bit like a beast of the honey at the minute, and we seem to be the honey, which is which is brilliant. It's brilliant, um, yeah, and that's testament to what you've built and the service you've built, but also the, I guess, the culture that you're promoting and reflecting on platforms like LinkedIn that your people are talking about. And um, yeah, I saw the announcement for private healthcare the other day, and it's saying I know we've discussed a lot over the last however many months, and just being able to get to that point, it's been brilliant yeah. that people have joined you, left, you know much let's be honest much larger companies with those bells and whistles yeah. of benefits and seeing something to go i'm willing for to willing to forsake that to join a business that are you know growing and i can see where those benefits might be introduced into, in the future but i want to be part of that and that's been mm. incredible as well so yeah. you should be incredibly proud of that oh i'm i'm i'm, I'm so proud of everyone um you know, my little squad. I love them to pieces, yeah. all of them. Mm. Um, I think the other the other thing that it's really nice now to, to kind of get to, so with, what, four and a half years, 30-something people, um, we already started looking, we need kind of a structure. We need to get, we need to get the guys into, um, you know, give them opportunities. Um, so private healthcare and all the benefits and all that kind of stuff, that's, that's one thing. But then is the personal development and it's it's amazing how many opportunities you do have so we work on a concept of you've got multiple roles uh you wear multiple hats and that kind of goes with um with squep tech with with you know what squep is about mm. um and it's really nice to be to to be able to be in a position where we're kind of starting building the structure um we've already socialized that the, that first draft internally how do we you know, how do we win work? How we deliver? How do we get paid? Um, and start putting that into into a target operating model. So it's really nice to be able to get to a point now where actually we're big enough to start talking about an operating model. Mm. It start talking about processes and what those processes are, and everyone is involved in that. So Sarah's having conversations with everyone in the team 
to kind of understand what's working for you, what's not working for you, what was your onboarding experience, what we should have here, what we should have there, you know. So we are now at a point where, you know, we've graduated from micro to small business, which was a incredible, incredible step. Um, but I think being recognised, uh, recognising ourselves that we are getting to this point, I think, I think is a is a my major milestone and then the opportunities internally that people now can have you know we can look at product owners we can look up head of mm. um you know departments in 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 a short while as well so because that's it's super important important and i was going to go back to asking a question around how do you maintain that company culture and, and especially employee engagement as well i think it's important for any mm. business to do that but especially when you're working geographically dispersed but having that yeah. um opportunity for your people to have a forum or a platform to talk mm. about their experiences and maybe in a very honest way how ways in which they feel that things could be improved or iterated upon as well because as you grow it's an evolution mm. isn't it and it all, it all changes um the employee engagement piece all kind of groups in with what what seems to have been a very popular phrase or really building in popularity over the last i'd say couple of years but in employee value proposition evp mm. everything you're talking about is holistically kind of grouped under that so things like career development and having a clearer mm. path in where to go i guess as a as a as a scaling business it's a little harder to identify, but getting to the point you are now, as you say, it's a huge milestone to, to mm. be able to start to map that out and important for retention of people as well as it attraction. Is. Yeah, it is. And I think um, that one, one exercise that, that we've done, obviously, with, with, our, with, with our products that, that, that we've got around um, competency, we've, um, we've done an exercise internally to kind of collect all the competencies that we perceive we've got. And... It's impressive the breadth of competencies that we have, and what is also really interesting is because we're wearing so many hats, people are expressing interest in areas that may or may not have been their, um, you know, their go-to. Or we can see we can see something in an individual that we can suggest. Do you fancy doing that for a little while? Hmm. Let's just support you in this. Let's just see whether that's a fit. I think you're a fit, but let's just see whether that's a fit with you. Where do you see your your progression? And I'm going to refrain to say career progression um, only because it's got a connotation of going upwards. Understood. Yep. Um, on a ladder. Mm. A career progression, in my mind, can be can go anywhere you know yes you can go up the ladder and you become manager and head off and all the kind of stuff and ultimately i'm looking for the next ceo so i can go back and do solution architecture which is my bread and butter mm. um but you know from from a progression perspective from a career progression i've never gone upwards very much at all i've only ever had one manager role when i was data development manager at, at um SSL. Yep. That was my only promotion in a manager role. All my background and all my knowledge and all the career that I've developed for myself was moving from, you know, data management. I've learned that documentation. I've learned about the product. Moved into business analysis. I've learned about that. Moved into project management. None of those have been career progressions in an upward climbing the ladder. Word. Yeah. It's not the climbing the ladder. Career progression is finding the sweet spot for you that fits you, your personality, and further that, and then explore other avenues. Hmm. So, you know, there's quite a lot of people in, in my world that I'm talking to, not necessarily a skeptic, but in, in, our, in, in our world, when they look at career, they look at, oh, I need to go up. I need to be a manager. I need to be this. And you don't need to do that. Mm. You know, you need to develop yourself to your strengths. And it could be trying out various roles without, without, without your career and then finding something that is certain. It, it may well be top of the ladder, but you may be, well be the best project manager in the project management team mm. and that that is you know career progression You're and right. that's where we kind of come with a competency platform that we've got 
Um, so eSquad is about that, is about identifying your competency, identifying the level that you can apply that competency, and then looking around to see where am I best placed? What are my strengths? Where can I go? Where's my other passion in life that it may prove my next career move? So I think is really, really important. And that is one of the one, one really strong passion of mine. And that's the reason why eSquap exists. So Squap Tech exists because of eSquap. Mm. And that's what eSquap is. It allows individuals to ascertain the level that they are doing that particular job and explore avenues of other of other things and not going up going in any direction yeah because because i think societally we're all we're all um kind of driven from school age to have this drive to go upwards so it's ladder theory Mm. every rung takes you higher and higher and higher my own experience is that I used to be a, a recruiter in my previous agency and went up the ladder because I was kind of almost brainwashed into me, I guess, or driven into me that that was a thing to do. Got to a management level. I couldn't stand it. Absolutely wasn't the right fit for me as in that environment yeah. as well, admittedly. But that is what that, that is society's beating that drum, isn't it, all the time about it is. progression is about pay rises. It's about yeah. seniority and it doesn't have to be that. It, you know, if, no. if what you're talking about with eScript was um, available for people at, uh, coming out of college in terms of careers advice, oh, God, yeah. it would be a game changer. Absolute game changer. It would. Mm. It absolutely would. And, you know, everybody wants more money. Everyone everyone want, wants a pay rise and all that kind of stuff. You don't, in my world and the world that I'm, I, I would like to build with Squap Tech, you don't get a pay rise when you're being moved. You get a pay rise to be compensated for the fact that you are the best that you are in what you are doing, mm. that you are enhancing what you are, that you keep learning and you keep developing and, in effect, helping the people around you. Mm. That, to me, is, you know, is career development. That, to me, is, is you know, in Squat Tech is going to carry on with all the, you know, it hasn't up to now, let's be honest, because we're still growing. Mm. But when we are at that point and everyone is on board with, with that message, but the time will come when we'll be able to, 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 to do that as well. But, you know, like I said, personally, I've developed into who I am today, not by being a manager. No, I love that. And I think I think your story will be inspiring for people. And, and what you just said, I think, is a real reminder for a lot of people that might have found themselves on that conveyor belt to just continue going through promotion, promotion, climbing the ladder of seniority, when really, sometimes if you just hit pause and take stock of what you really enjoy doing or what you're really good at, does that align itself yeah. with just going up? to the next level within a business as well. Yeah. So just going back to the fact that the business is a, a fully remote business, when it comes to hiring, what advantages yeah. or maybe disadvantages have you found from being a fully remote business in, in terms of identifying the right people to join you? Well, I've got you. Thank you. You don't need to so say that. That's, not, that's really not a paid for, <laughs> that's not a paid for plug. Are there, are there any disadvantages? I haven't found one yet. Okay. No, mm. I haven't found yet. Um, the advantage is that we just get talent, whatever that talent is, without disrupting that person's life. Yeah. You know, so we are now, thanks to you, between Penzance and Edinburgh. Yeah, amazing. And everything in between. And soon, we'll be, we'll be in Ireland as well. Amazing. So... You know, it that is wherever wherever the right people for the roles, the right people for the business are within their own home environment, that's that's good enough okay. for me. And what's your view on the number of business leaders now trying to get their people back into the office? I think that's a little bit daft. To some respects, and I'll only be shot down here. But that may come across as I don't trust my people. So I need to see them in the office to make sure that they are doing the job. I'd like to believe that the people, not just the ones working from Squeptech, but the people that are being treated as mature individuals 
and responsible individuals will give back that trust. Mm. And, you know, are we as skeptics sitting there and having a look? Have you clocked in or have you clocked out? No, am I heck? I haven't got time for that. I don't want to do that. I hate micromanaging. Mm. It's been done to me and I'm never going to do it to any, any other individual. We have to respect the people that are working with us. And demanding for people to go back in, into the business. Unless you are a business that you absolutely need to have people on premises, then, okay, that is because the job demands it, that you are at that particular location. But people in tech, like us, you could be on the beach and, you know, still be productive. As long as, in, in my view, as long as the clients are happy, as long as the clients are getting their job done at the best of our abilities from a consulting perspective and all the other stuff that we do you know you do that around the priorities the priorities in in my life are christian and phil and goss yeah you know and they will although they haven't come first in the last four years let's just be very honest and i always say to everybody in 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 the team Please do what I say. Don't do what you do. <laughs> you know, d yeah, not, yeah. Don't do that. Please don't do what I do because that is just not good. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know. Jury's out. There may be advantages for those particular companies to ask for people to come back. I, I agree with you. To be to be perfectly honest with you, again, I think if you're working, if we speak specifically about tech, there's very little case for people being in an office environment or even companies that where most of their operations are enabled by technology. Very little case. So I think a lot of it comes down to trust. A lot of it comes down to, I don't know, just this way of working being grained in us culturally for years and years and years. Um, yeah, I think so. And then, you know, there's no doubt that you do need to meet the team face to face in some occasions. But that's why places like WeWork are around. That's why, you know, you've got the opportunities to, even a coffee shop, some coffee shops in London, um, at, at least, you can rent part of the coffee shop and close it down and then get people down and you still have those face-to-face -face meetings. You know, it's, you can still have that. We've done that in the past. Mm. You know, we're using one of our partner's offices down here in London and we come in and, and meet here when, when we need. So yes, there is an, a level where certain things you need to have the team around and, and have face-to-face -face conversations, but that doesn't necessarily warrant to have an office. Yeah, no, completely agree. I'm going to ask you a question now that you might be uncomfortable answering because I don't know if you oh, I don't God. know if you would labour yourself <laughs> as someone banging the drum for this. But um, what advice would you give to women aspiring to become tech leaders? Because that is what you are. You are a tech leader. So what what would you what advice would you give to anyone aspiring to become a tech leader? Oh wow! Um, don't look around you. Don't let yourself be influenced by people around. Um, interestingly, that's the conversation we had last night um in 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 a hotel and i think i said i said before um i don't look at what other people are doing um there are a lot of people around that would bring up the negatives yes but but did you think about this but did you think about that there are no boundaries the boundaries are the ones that you create yourself if you choose to put yourself in a room and close the door and lock throw the key away then that's your own internal choice. But if you choose to walk out of that room and fight for it, it's not a walk in a park, but you have to, you, you, you have to play to your strengths. In it, what, what, one of the books that I've, I've read, and I keep rereading all the time, it's an oldie, is um, How to Influence um, People. Oh. Um, it's a Dale Carnegie um, book. And it's, one book that I, you know, stumbled across when I was trying to do some some self development, when I stepped into the consulting world, so before before Scrap Tech, and I stumbled over that book, and I have no idea why I didn't know about it because it's as old as ages, and that to me is the book that I always go back to, and the same part of it, the same paragraph it will have a completely different meaning depending depending on the situation on the frame of mind that i am on that particular day but in effect all dale carnegie says and what i've done with phil's help as well is i will stop where my own capabilities will stop mm -hmm. 
And when I find that wall, I'll just find something else to go around it. It's one of those, it's just, you always have to grow. You always have to learn. And I, I, my advice is don't use the society's boundaries as your own boundaries. Brilliant. That's lovely, Bobby. Thank you for that. I didn't know if you were comfortable asking that, answering that question, but it was a, it was an amazing answer. I think I had a bit of practice last yeah, night. No, honestly, it's fantastic. <laughs> and I think you know, one of the biggest reasons cited for women not entering tech as a profession and then maybe not having the confidence to step into tech leadership roles is a lack of female role models. And I think what you've just embodied I there is I, yeah. you are a female ro- role model in this space as well. And it's criminal you've not done a podcast yet. Hopefully this is the... <laughs> This is the start of um, of a few more invites coming through. Um, I mean, you're too busy to do it anyway, to be honest, half the time. But, um, okay, as a, as a closing tradition on this podcast, I don't mm-hmm. know if you listen to any of the other major podcasts out there, of which this isn't one just yet. One of the closing traditions is to um, answer a question left by a previous guest. My tradition on this podcast, Bobby... Okay. Is, is not going to be that. It's going to be to answer a question posed up in a lot of my marketing, as you might have seen previously. So my mum has, has posed this question. I'll play it down the mic and see if you can hear it. And if not, we can always, I can always just ask it to you. I don't know what this question is. Okay, right, cool. so whatever she says. Right, wait a minute. Hi there, Bobby. Could you tell me what technological advancement you're most excited about? Thanks very much. That was my mum. It's Lisa, if you wanted to say anything to Lisa. Well, Lisa, that is a good question. From a software development perspective, I think is the ability to build pretty much anything. I'll just give you an example, I think. That's probably... And, and he's also kudos to one of the guys in, the, in, in our team, a chap called Sean. We're working heavily with um, APIs and integrations and all that good, good stuff. And as it happens, there's, um, there's always limitations um, when things happen. We've had quite a challenging project. We've done most of that integration. And there's one little bit which just does not, just does not work. And we've had a think of how to fill that gap. And Sean has just come out in one of our calls and said, I'll build a robot. Wow. Okay. So off he went, and an hour later or something, he's just put something together through code. Mm. I mean, there is nothing more exciting that for someone to say, I know how to fix that problem. I'm going to go and build a little robot that is logging into the system, is picking the data from there, and he's taking it and putting it here, and he's doing all sorts of other things and with it. I mean, the ability to have that kind of de- technology available for us to use to enhance day-to-day things that, you know, they should be there, but they're not for, for, for whatever reason, I think that's amazing. And the fact that the technology, what, what to me, what what technology is doing to an individual is allowing that individual to kind of have an open view about what is the art of the possible. Mm. It goes back to what I was saying before about closing the door and not getting out. You know, if you do that, then you're not going to advance. And then from a tech perspective, there's always something new, always something new. But to be able to kind of just throw it out of the blue, kind of say, right, I can I, I can build a robot. I can get a robot to do that. Um, so I think the guys called it Squeppy, oh, which was amazing. Hilarious. Wow, trademark, <laughs> trademark that straight away. Yeah, trademark. incredible. Yeah. No, that's amazing, Bobby. And um Thank you so much for your time, because honestly, you are, from the day I met you, just an incredibly inspiring person, and I feel like my, my both my professional and personal life have, have um, you've just added so much to it since I met you as well, so thank you so much for taking the time to do this, I know we've run over a bit as well, um, but yeah, thank you for being one of the first guests, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's, it's, it's been hilarious. I've really enjoyed it. I know I was very nervous, but I have really enjoyed it. Um, and of course, we're over time because I can never finish a meeting on time. This is a Bobby trademark as well. This know. is one of the Bobbyisms. And um, I, do you know what? I think, I think 20 odd minutes over is probably good going, to be honest with you, Bobby, anyway. <laughs> I know. Um, but th- but I thank know. you so much. I will let you get on and um, I will catch up with you soon. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Jobsworth. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to like and subscribe. You can stay connected by following me on LinkedIn for more insights on the world of work, behind the scenes content and updates on upcoming episodes. 
We're already thinking about guests for season two, so if there is a particular topic you'd like us to discuss, then please send in your suggestions to hello at jobsworth.com. <laughs>